Hello, everyone. We're just going to take a moment to allow people to join us and log on. We're still having people join us, so we're going to wait a little bit longer. Okay, we are going to get started. Hello and welcome to Hawk Mountain Sanctuary's Autumn Lecture Series. This evening's program is Team Warbler from Chesapeake Bay to Panama Bay with Dr. Catherine Viveret of the Virginia Commonwealth University. Hi everybody. Kathy, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Oh, thank you for having me. I wish I was really there though. <laughs> us too, us too. And to everyone joining us in the audience, thank you so much for joining us this evening as well. My name is Jamie Dawson and I'm the Director of Education at Hawk Mountain Sanctuary. As you may know, Hawk Mountain is the world's very first refuge for birds of prey. And we continue to work hard to be leaders in raptor conservation, science and education locally and globally around the world. Hawk Mountain is a private nonprofit and membership is the lifeblood of our organization. To all of our members, thank you, thank you, thank you for everything that you do to support us. And if you're joining us this evening and you're not a member, we hope that you consider becoming one in the future. Hawk Mountain hopes that everyone remains safe and healthy during these times of COVID challenges. And we are thrilled to offer our local and global community a variety of free virtual programming. As always, Hawk Mountain greatly appreciates and depends on donations. Just so everyone is aware, this program is being recorded. The video will then be accessible on Hawk Mountain's YouTube channel as a continued resource. We also have a link on our website directly connecting you to our YouTube channel. At any point during this evening's program, viewers may submit questions through the Q&A feature on the Zoom platform and we've designated time at the end of the program to take some questions from the audience. And we are absolutely thrilled that Dr. Kathy Viveret is joining us all the way from Virginia to teach us about Team Warbler. And before we go further, I'd like to take a moment to share some of Kathy's background experience with our audience. Kathy Viveret is an assistant professor in the Center for Environmental Studies at Virginia Commonwealth University. The focus of her research includes avian communities occupying river systems and associated wetland and riparian habitats. Kathy collaborates with faculty from VCU and other institutions on a long-term nest box study of prothonotary warblers. So Kathy, how did you become interested in the field of avian science? Well, Hawk Mountain played a big role in that. I was a um, environmental educator here in Richmond at a place called Maymont Foundation. And um, we got our first birds of prey, non-releasable birds of prey to use in um, environmental education programs. And I needed information about housing and care. And this was long before Google. I don't even know how I found out about Hawk Mountain, but I did and I called and talked to a fellow named Jim Brett. And he gave me information about housing these birds and I didn't think much about it after that, but in the late 1989, 1990, I moved to Pennsylvania and realized I was in the shadow of Hawk Mountain and I went up there and I started volunteering and that turned into a part-time environmental educator position, which became a full-time environmental education position, which eventually became a biologist position. So wow, a wonderful time working there. That's awesome. So how long did you work at Hawk Mountain? Six years, 1990, 1996, I think. Nice. And I know that I have um, 
seen you in the past uh, come up with, with your students from Virginia. Would you like to share a little bit about your continued uh, connection to Hawk Mountain? So yeah, that's been great. I um, I actually just started on the faculty about three years ago. I've been at VCU. I got my master's here. I got my PhD here, working the whole time here. Um, and one of the first classes I started teaching was a raptor ecology class. And a big part of that class, it's in the fall, it's the plan anyway, is we do a four day trip to Hawk Mountain. And it's very hands-on and Unfortunately, we were not able to come this fall, but we did come for the past two years. So that's been just a really nice, um, a nice full circle for me. Wonderful. And let's keep our fingers crossed for fall 2021. Next we year, that's fall. correct. Well, thank you so much, Kathy. Um, it's so awesome to learn about your personal connection to Hawk Mountain. So we have a lot of people out in the audience that want to learn about warblers. Yes. So I'm gonna turn it over to you. Okay, now everybody, even though I'm teaching remotely, I actually have not used Zoom a lot. So try to be patient with me. Um, go up here. Okay, so I'm gonna be talking today um, a little about, we're hopefully going to show you a video, we were having some technical difficulties about the Chesapeake Bay, which is Tidal River, James River of Chesapeake Bay, where we do our research here in Virginia, and also about a class I teach where we go to Panama and do some research on prothonotary warblers in Panama. So first I wanted to give you a quick introduction to the team. This is a, as Jamie mentioned, a long-term study. It started in 1987. I'm old, but I did not start that project. Um, it was started by Charlie and Lee and Blem, who were uh, biology professors here at VCU. And it's grown, the team has grown, and it's now a collaboration among faculty here at VCU, as well as colleagues across the breeding and uh, non-breeding range of prothonotary warblers students, both undergraduate and graduate students, and community partners. It's just a really great program. Um, and the warbler. I always start with this because the sanitary is a very hard name to say. We do a lot of outreach with kids and with the general public. And they're always like, where did that name come from? So I like to give you a little background. It comes from protonotary which was a Vatican registrar who wore golden robes. So it's related to that beautiful golden color of the prothonotary warbler. Um, the species name is Citria, which is a little more, makes a little more sense. It's from, or we're more familiar with it. Um, again, that beautiful yellow citrusy color of the birds. Now, a lot of people wonder why, this is another common question, is why do we care? Why have we been studying this species for 30 years? And besides the fact that they're so beautiful, they're sort of, we call them the jewel of the wetlands around here. They are representative of many species of neotropical migrant birds that have been declining over the past century. Um, there was recent research many of you probably saw that shows that we've lost 2.5 billion migratory birds since 1970, which represents 30% of the population. Um, my prothonotary warblers numbers are declining across their range. They nest in the eastern, southeastern United States and they spend the non-breeding season in Central America and Northern Colombia. And they are not endangered. Um, they're real, very common here around the Chesapeake Bay. But if you'll notice on this chart, about the time this project started, they were in a relatively steep decline. And that was why Charlie Blim decided to start this project um, 
to study prothonotary warblers in the Chesapeake Bay to try to both increase the population and understand why they were declining. The other really important thing about prothonotary warblers is their habitat specialists. They are wetland species. They occupy forested wetlands. Um, here in Virginia, if you look on the top right, that is a cypress, called cypress swamp. Um, they are very common in the tributaries of the Chesapeake Bay and south of here. They also <clears throat> occupy bottomland hardwood, hardwood forests, all of which have been under some conservation challenges for many years, either being cut down for agriculture, for development, for wood products. And then um, in the tropics where they spend their non-breeding, they inhabit tropical mangrove forests, which are some of the most endangered habitats in the world as well as these inland lagoons called Cienegas, which I'll talk about a little bit at the very end of my talk if I have time. Um, they were once known as the golden swamp warbler and I have uh, a middle school that we work with regularly on this project. They are also part of Team Warbler. They build our bird boxes for us and they have talked about petitioning um, the AOS to change the name back to the Golden Swamp Warbler because it's such a more descriptive name for the species and it's easier to say. The other reason that we care about prothonotary warblers is they can provide a measure of habitat quality for these very critical habitat, these wetland habitats. And they can do that in several different ways. So on the left, on my left, you have the Chesapeake Bay. You can see the bald cypress swamp in the small picture. And on the bottom left, you have the um, Panama Bay and the mangrove forests. And we can monitor prothonotary warblers in those habitats. And it can tell us something about the condition of those habitats. If you look on the top right, we can do this in several ways. We can simply count how many prothonotary warblers occur in a habitat, perhaps across a range of various um, habitat types from small young forests to large older forests. And we're going to go on the assumption, which is not always true, but that if you have higher density, if you have more individuals, then that is going to be a higher quality habitat. On the breeding grounds, we might be counting the number of males that have territories. We might count the number of breeding pairs, the number of eggs laid, the number of nestlings that hatch. And these are all things that we do count here in Virginia. Um, the number that are successfully fledged from a habitat. We can also look at the individuals. We capture and band the individuals here in Virginia. And we can look at their body condition, which is um, an indicator of individual condition. So obviously, if you're, in, if you're healthy and you're in better body condition and you're well fed, then we're going to assume that you are inhabiting a habitat that's higher quality that provides the resources that you need to have a territory to raise young, et cetera. The other really interesting thing about prothonotary warblers, we talk a lot about that beautiful golden yellow color. They get that color from the food that they eat. So if you think of salmon, we all know that if we get salmon that's wild caught, it's going to be brighter pink or brighter red. It gets those colors from um, carotenoids that are in the food that's a pigment that's in the food. And a, it's called an honest signal in birds. So a brighter yellow individual likely is a better hunter, a better provider, a better mate, a better at defending a territory. So if you have brighter individuals in a habitat or a site, 
we are going to say that that is probably an indication of habitat quality. So I'm gonna start by introducing you to our study area on the Chesapeake Bay and hopefully our video is gonna work. Um, but here we monitor breeding bird boxes. The sonitary warblers make an excellent study system because they are secondary cavity nesters, which means they nest in abandoned cavities. They cannot excavate tree cavities themselves, but they might nest in tree cavities that a woodpecker perhaps has excavated. They're not very picky. They will also nest in broken limbs, um, but they nest in cavities. And because of this, they are one of only two warblers who who nest in cavity, and they are perfectly happy to nest in boxes, man-made boxes that are provided. And that makes them an, shall I say, an easy bird to study because you can have a high densities, you can have large sample sizes if you're in an area like we are with plenty of prothonotary warblers. This is a picture of a female prothonotary and one of our boxes. I call her a pot sticker. You're going to see in the video how we catch these birds. And you can see the um, box entrance on the, just above her head on the right. And you, we put a net up there. And usually when we, we pull up to the boxes, we do all our work in canoes. The boxes are on poles in the water. Um, these females pop right into our nets that we were able to open, that she would not get off the nest. We were able to open the door and take a picture of her. That's very unusual, but this is a beautiful opathonotary on her nest. Let me give you a little bit of history. As I said, um, Charlie and Leanne Blim, they're very beloved faculty members here at VCU. I still run into people who took Charlie's ornithology class. I have run into people that remembered him that were selling me cars at a Honda dealership. Um, the woman that's head of compliance here for our IACUC program. So many people just love taking ornithology from him. And he started, they started this project in 1987. They put 150 boxes out. If you look at the map just below Charlie and Leanne, they're there in the, in the canoe. Um, I'm sorry, it's not a very good map, but you can sort of see the, James River meandering along there. And Richmond is upstream. You follow the arrow. So that's where I'm sitting right now. And all of the study sites are downstream in the tidal freshwater reach of the James River. Charlie and Leanne ended up, by the time they retired, they probably had 300, 400 boxes they were monitoring at two sites and there's a third site with several hundred boxes that the Richmond Audubon Society monitors. Um, Charlie and Leanne retired in 2005 and we were concerned what would happen to their project but about not many years before that VCU was gifted 350 acres on the James River in this area and the director research director and director of the Rice Center, it's the VC Rice River Center, agreed to provide some support to keep the project going. I was a research associate at the time. And so myself with a lot of volunteers kept the banding program up. And fortunately, a few years later in 2007, Dr. Leslie Bullock, who's on the top right, um, joined the faculty here and many of her graduate students now, a lot of the research I will be talking about is done by her graduate students and I'm lucky enough to get to work with them as well. Also, um, about the time that the Blems retired, the data that they had been collecting up until that, so almost 20 years of data at that point was used to establish uh, Audubon important bird area. So this part of the James River is now not a bond important bird area in part because we have such a high population of prothonotary warblers. And uh, Leslie and I now monitor two sites, 
one at Deep Bottom Park and one at the Rice River Center. We don't monitor as many boxes as the BLEMS did, but we check them more often. So every box is visited at least twice a week. So I'm gonna let Leslie um, introduce you through a video. I think it's better than me talking and showing you a lot of pictures to our study sites and some of the history and why we do this project. So Jamie, should I just stop sharing? Yeah, I, I think so, thanks. Okay, let me share my screen. Okay. Okay. Leslie Bullock. I'm an assistant teaching professor in the Department of Biology in the Center for Environmental Studies at Virginia Commonwealth University. And we are here at Deep Bottom Park in eastern Henrico, southeast of Richmond, Virginia. And we are here to study the prothonotary warblers. And we are about to go out on this creek, which is right here on the James River. And we have prothonotary warbler nesting boxes, uh, a little less than 70 boxes that we monitor regularly, twice a week. And there's a prothonotary warbler singing. Um, and what we're doing is we're looking at the reproductive ecology of the species. It's a migratory songbird that spends its winters in the tropics. Uh, the, really the center of its wintering range is from Costa Rica down to Colombia. And then they breed all throughout the east, southeastern United States. Um, we're kind of towards the end of their breeding season. Uh, we're going to be banding some nestlings today and we're going to be catching some females that are incubating sort of a few late clutches that have been started. So one of the main reasons why this project was started back in 1987 by Charlie and Leanne Blim was to bolster populations. Um, these species have been shown to be declining at about one to 2% per year range wise and box programs for other species have been shown to bolster populations. And uh, that certainly has been the case here in Virginia. Yay! That's how it's done. <laughs> So this is a female prothonotary warbler that was just incubating, um, or actually um, brooding her nestlings that are just, just hatched in the past day or so. And this is kind of a cool thing about these birds is they have um, a brood patch. Which is like almost like a blister. If you've ever burned yourself, you know how your skin gets sort of puffy and um, kind of fluid filled and highly vascularized. Um, that's a brood, a brood patch that these guys use to put right up next to the eggs and the young before they can thermoregulate to keep them warm. So we can tell that this is a female prothonotary warbler because she has a brood patch and because we caught her incubating or brooding her young, but also because at the top of her head, you can see she is really kind of pale. The males have a much brighter um, crown than the females. So there's two grips we have. This is the Bander's grip, how I have her here. Um, and we, you know, it looks like I'm kind of squeezing her, like I have her pretty tight around the neck, but I'm very loosely holding her body. So she's able to, that's really an important thing for birds because they don't have a diaphragm. They just have these um, uh, air sacs sort of distributed throughout their body that are connected to the lungs. And if you squeeze their bodies, then they're not able to breathe. And so we like to keep a nice loose grip on them. And then we have the photographer's grip like this. So you can take a nice picture. A second reason why these projects were started were to have opportunities for students to get engaged in research. What I really like students to do is ask a question and then we collect the data and we decide about what, what data do we need to collect to answer that question. And then um, in the fall semester, they usually do an independent study. And that is really where the light bulbs go off for a lot of students when, you know, okay, I've collected this data, we were out in the field, that was really fun. But then how do you take those data and make them answers to questions? And that's a pretty exciting part of it. All right, I'm gonna let her go. You ready? Mm 
Hey, Kathy, did you want to? Yep, I'll take it back again. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Sure. So I hope everyone could see and hear that. Um, trying to get my. No, it's not. Now my PowerPoint is not wanting to work. There we go. So as I said, we do um, most of our field work, by canoe, all of our field work by canoe. Uh, because these rivers are tidal, which means we have a high tide twice a day, low tide twice a day. Unlike a lot of other bird work, we are not necessarily out first thing in the morning at sunrise, but that's definitely the best time to be out on the river. And, um, but we're totally dependent on the tide. So we have to be out a couple hours before and a couple hours after high tide to be able to reach the boxes. We've learned a lot about the prothonotary warblers here in Virginia. We have very high density. We have very high return rates. Those females who often are born in the boxes will come back here to nest. We had one female who lived that we know of to be nine years old. She was born in one box and nested either in the box she was born in or the box on either side for the next seven years. They also are, I think Leslie mentioned, they double clutch. So they arrive sometime in April. They lay one clutch of eggs. And then later, some individuals will raise a second brood. Um, we also know that some females uh, dump their eggs in the nests of other females, which hasn't been described in prothonotary or in warblers very often, only one other species, I believe. So the mom, the social mom of a pair is not always the mom of every nestling in the box, which was an unusual, something we had not expected. We also currently are doing a lot of work looking at diet. The birds eat both terrestrial and aquatic insects, which again makes them a very good indicator of water quality. And we're trying to get a better handle on exactly how the timing of nesting and the emergence of these aquatic insects impacts their reproductive biology. So that's the Chesapeake Bay. Now we're going to head down to Panama Bay. A big um, deal in avian research now is looking at the full life cycle. Here in North America, someone like me is going to do most of my research here in North America, right down the street from the university, if at all possible. Um, so we, we tend to think about the birds being our birds. And we tend to do a lot of research on their breeding biology, but to really understand migratory birds biology and to understand what is the most important conservation challenge to them, we have to understand their full life cycle. We need to not only conserve habitat on their breeding grounds, but we have to understand what's happening on their non-breeding grounds. And if there are conservation challenges there, and with migratory birds, you have everything in between. So trying to track birds over time, especially these very small songbirds is difficult and um, something that we've just started doing in the last 10 years, at least for our project. In 2010, we were approached by the International Alliances Program of National Audubon Society. And they look to link individuals working in IBAs across the migratory, important bird areas across the migratory range. And they came to us with a proposal that we team up with folks in Panama Audubon down on Panama Bay because as we know, birds not only connect ecosystems, but really they connect people and culture and places. These are resources 
that we share and by supporting each other, we are going to be more successful in conserving these resources. So why Panama? Um, we know that prothonotary warblers overwinter there. There are studies from Panama Bay from the 1990s. We know there are a lot of prothonotaries there during the non-breeding season. As I said, we've been studying um, breeding biology here in the Chesapeake Bay for a long time. And the Chesapeake Bay and Panama Bay share a lot of similarities. Both of them are large estuaries with a rich human and natural history. Both of them are commercial centers. Both of them have um, provide food and jobs. They are really in um, important to the communities, human communities who live on them. And we also share many of the same um, conservation challenges. If you were like me, I grew up in Richmond and I have since I was a teenager been hearing and involved with the Chesapeake Bay Foundation in their very large scale efforts to quote unquote, save the bay. Well, similarly in Panama Bay where this map on the bottom shows the Audubon important bird area along Panama Bay, that is a internationally, globally important area for migrating um, shorebirds. So they under many of the same development pressures and pollution pressures and other conservation challenges that we have here on the Chesapeake Bay. And then of course we both share this, um, the prothonotary warbler as well as many other migratory birds, including shorebirds, who will also migrate through the Chesapeake Bay every year. So why mangroves? Um, mangrove forests are extremely important as habitat for a number of neotropical migrant birds, as well as many of the um, non-migratory species in the tropics. They are very harsh environments. Mangrove is sort of a general term that describes a tree or a shrub that is physiologically adapted to live in very saline intertidal habitats. They're essentially the tropical equivalent of salt marshes here in Virginia. They're also highly productive and important ecosystems. They produce a lot of detritus, carbon, and nutrients that we believe are throughout welling, feed those, I'm using my hands here, I know you guys can't really see it, but feed those tidal flats that are so important to migrating shorebirds. These are really important stopover sites for migrating shorebirds and um, the mangrove forests that fringe Panama Bay are likely a very important resource to those mudflats. And again, this is um, mangrove forests outside of Panama City. The top are black mangroves, the bottom picture are red mangroves. And this is Panama City. So just like Richmond, uh, Panama City is huge. Panama is a very vital um, commercial district. It's, it's a beautiful city and it is expanding rapidly. And you can see they are filling and building on top of many of these mangroves, even though they are in the protected areas. Um, this is a picture from a summer that my co-directors and I went down there and literally <laughs> our guide and our friend chased these dump trucks down to find out where the dirt was coming from. But we literally sat there and watched them filling in some of these mangrove areas. And again, when you want to compare Chesapeake Bay and Panama Bay, here is a graph that shows declines in prothonotary warblers over time, as well as declines in the bottomland forests in North America and mangrove forests in the tropics. So a key component of Team Warbler is an international course 
that we developed when we started talking to um, the International Alliances program about how to go to Panama and how to do some work down there and work with community partners down there. There, of course, was no funding, which is um, common if you're at a university. And so we actually went to our division of community engagement. VCU is very supportive of international research. They're very supportive of hands-on investigative training for students. And so we were granted money from the Division of Community Engagement to develop this international course. And our hope was that the students would go to Panama, we would work with our collaborators down there and start a possibly long-term research project where we could collect data to help conservationists in Panama justify the protection of mangrove forests. I had thought when I talked to Jamie last fall about doing this talk that I would be reporting about spring 2020. Uh, we were supposed to go back and take a class down there in March and that did not happen. So I'm going to be talking some about past years. We've been going um, since 2011. We occasionally skip a year, so we did not go in 2019. Like I said, we were supposed to go in 2020. This is an upper level course. It's a 400 and 500 level course. So um, graduate students and undergraduates can take the class. It's a full semester course. And we spend two weeks in Panama, but they spend the rest of the semester analyzing and producing um, deliverables on the data that they collect while their students are in Panama. So we have lectures on migration ecology, wetlands and mangroves, temperate versus tropical ecology, both here at VCU as well as with our collaborators and guest lecturers when we're in Panama. And another big objective of this course, we don't have a big ecology program at VCU. We're a gigantic urban university. Our main campus is downtown in the city. And so we wanted an opportunity for students who did want to go into wildlife and conservation and ecological research to get some hands-on training in common field methods. Um, this is, I always have to, I think this is 2013. This is in the mangroves. You can see these are very muddy, wet habitats. And I just want to point out, we have as many, uh, we've taken as many 20, as 22 students to Panama each year. We have far more students apply to go than we have spots for. And with this much hands-on training, it's impossible for one faculty member to run this kind of program. So we have multiple faculty members and at least two go every trip. And then some people can have a year off here and there. But this is Dr. Ed Crawford. He's a wetland ecologist who is the deputy director of the Rice River Center. And he was one of my co-directors. He um, decided, and along with Leslie Bullock, he decided he was not gonna be able to go after 2018. And one reason we didn't go in 2019, but I'm very, very lucky. This is Dan Albrecht Mellinger. He was a master's student here at VCU. And he was a teaching assistant for the class for two years. And then he went off to get his PhD, but he did his PhD research in Panama. So he helped with another year. He helped us in 2017. And he just got hired last year at VCU. So he is going to, um, help teach the class in the future when we can start going back again. Our community partners, again, are uh, Panama Audubon Society. The picture sort of in the middle, uh, that's Rosabel Mera, who's uh, um, the director of Panama Audubon. And you can also, we do, as well as field work, we do a lot of outreach with the community. Panama Audubon has this amazing um, outreach program where they actually put educators in the schools and they bring students out to our study sites while we're there. 
which is always very exciting for the students to get out and see the birds up close and even be able to release them. In 2018, we also did a banding demonstration at one of the local parks, which is near one of our study sites. Our other partner is um, Guido Borghito and Adopted Panama Rainforest. He is our host. He um, helps us find biologists to help us in the field. He, we couldn't do this project without him. And he actually, his nonprofit, they have a private cloud forest preserve and they do quite a bit of tree planting throughout Panama. So for the first few years, here's some of our research objections, objectives for the students which was across three mangrove sites that vary in age and maturity. We were gonna investigate the relationship between mangrove characteristics, vegetation structure, just tree height, which is a proxy for mangrove age, um, canopy cover, which is a proxy for disturbance, patch size and surrounding land use. And we were gonna compare those things to resident and migrant songbird richness and abundance. We did this by con um, continuous effort mist netting. In each of the sites, we would set up eight to 10 mist nets. It's a very busy banding station. We, um, in this particular year, I had quite a few students that were trained banders and we had we were so busy at this particular site, we had three or four people banding birds continuously. We also look at body condition, specifically of uh, prothonotary warblers and northern water thrush. You can think of body condition as like uh, the body mass index that people, doctors give to people where you're taking um, the size of the bird, you take the mass of the bird, and you can use the size um, of the bird so that you can compare across different sized birds. In this case, whereas the body mass index, it is mass, human mass and height in birds, you can use uh, tarsus length or wing length. And then again, we look at feather reflectance. We're again looking at where are the brightest individuals found. We do that by very gently plucking a few feathers off the crown and the breast of the bird that then we can put on a spectrometer and measure the um, reflectance, the yellow reflectance of the feathers. Quickly, here are the three sites. Juan Diaz is a site, again, that was studied in the 1990s, and that's our mature mangrove site. Panama Viejo is a tiny little mangrove, very young. Uh, when we started, probably about 10 years old. It's right beside a city park in the middle of Panama City and Playa Bonita, which is our intermediate site. The site differences. And the mature mangrove forest, and again, these are really beautiful, muddy, wet habitats, but we have very dense, tall canopy, um, large saplings, lots of water cover, which is very important during the dry season in the tropics, and uh, sparse understory, the young mangroves in contrast, with very dense, low canopy, um, a dense understory and this particular site right on the coast, like so many coastal sites, had quite a lot of plastic. And what we found among these differences, uh, among these sites with the dominant species were the prothonotary warbler, the northern water thrush, which is another neotropical migrant bird and the spotted sandpiper. And as we expected, we had a gradient of species richness with the mature sites having the greatest number of species and the young sites having the fewest number of species. And this is from 2012, which is the first year that I went. And just to give you an idea of some of the species we see when we're there. And I've got to say my very, I love prothonotary warblers, but my very favorite bird is the American pig, pygmy kingfishers. 
tiny little kingfisher. So beautiful. Um, the mangrove warbler, which is a resident species there. It's another beautiful one. Um, we several species of wood creeper and some other neotropical migrants like the Tennessee warbler, the American red start. And you can see in one day at Juan Diaz, we had a total of 106 individuals and 17 species. When we looked at body condition and feather reflectance um, in prothonotary warblers in the um, older, larger, more mature forests, they had better body condition and they had more carotenoids in their feathers, which is reflected by the fact that they had um, greater reflectance in the yellow uh, spectrum. And this is important if we go back to from Chesapeake Bay to Panama Bay and back, we know that there are carryover effects that what happens in Virginia is going to impact what happens to the birds on their um, non-breeding grounds and what happens on their non-breeding grounds will have an effect on them on their breeding grounds. So what we found is higher quality individuals based on body condition and on feather reflectance are occupying higher quality habitat on the wintering grounds. This translates into those birds are able to be ready to migrate earlier. They're gonna arrive on their breeding grounds earlier and in better condition. They're gonna get the best territories and they're gonna have higher reproductive success on the breeding grounds. So just to recap, mature mangroves, higher species richness, higher number of individuals, more mangrove specialists, prow and NOAA in better body condition, higher water cover, which is again very important, and higher carotenoid content in the feathers. And I just want to point out this is that even now, the development in Panama is still going on. These were our study sites from 2011 to 2018. If you look at Juan Diaz mangroves in 2006 and compare them to the Juan Diaz mangroves in 2017, our original site is gone. It has now been um, drained and dried up, likely do it. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't drained on purpose necessarily, and it hasn't been filled or built on, at least not since I've been there. Um, but it likely dried up due to the hydrological changes around it as development was going on around the site. So this is our site with the highest species richness and the largest number of prow and northern water thrush recorded at this site. And basically, the entire site is now dead. So what were the conservation implications of this work is preserving mature undisturbed mangroves, um, conserving rather than trying to restore whenever possible, also restoring hydrological regimes to protect the existing mangroves, um, to encourage ecotourism-based livelihoods, which gives a um, incentive to communities in the area to try and preserve these habitats, and reforestation of riparian corridors. If this sounds familiar, it's the same kind of um, analyses and conservation um, recommendations we hear all the time here on the breeding grounds. Now, these studies both um, on the Chesapeake Bay and in Panama there are really only two sites and the planetary warblers breed throughout southeastern North America and winter throughout uh, Central America and northern South America. So this is just a snapshot. What about the rest of the migratory range? I'm just going to very quickly talk about some other work we've been involved in. There is a planetary warbler working group that includes universities and Audubon Society and NGOs 
throughout the breeding range and the non-breeding range, including Panama, Audubon, and Selva, which is a conservation organization, research organization in Colombia. Um, we were involved in a project where we were tracking prothonotary warblers from eight sites throughout the breeding range using light level geolocators. These are teeny tiny little tracking devices that record daylight and uh, sunset every day. And you can do some analysis and it's a very imprecise way to track birds, but we can get a lot of information that we weren't able to get previously and the interesting result and unexpected result is yes, Panama is an important um, wintering area for prothonotary warblers, but Colombia is extremely important. And nearly 29 of the 33 individuals that we tracked from across the breeding range overwintered in Colombia. The others were in Panama and Venezuela. And like I said, this is a kind of a rough estimate. These are not very precise tracking devices like you have when you have um, satellite tracking or GPS trackers. But we also analyze stable isotope um, signatures, hydrogen stable isotope and genetic markers. When I say we, it's the royal we, graduate students here at VCU. And this confirmed that there's a great deal of mixing on the uh, wintering grounds that birds from all over the breeding area converge in, in Colombia and that all the populations mix on the um, non-breeding or overwintering habitats. And here you can see also some of the important um, stopover sites during migration. They also did some analyses looking at prothonotary warbler occupancy at sites, again, across Panama and Colombia. If you look at the small box, the B box, you'll see those three red sites, that's Panama Bay. Um, and similar to, this was point counts, 50 meter circle point counts that were done during two seasons earlier in the year, November to December, and again later in January and February. And you can see again, these coastal sites are very important and have the highest abundance of birds, prothonotary warblers per hectare. And they were looking at multiple habitat types, including mangroves, cienegas, these lagoons, as well as drier forests, secondary forests and, and wooded wetlands. And similar to our results in Panama, they found that canopy height was a good predictor of prothonotary warbler density, and at least in mangroves and the lagoons, that which are these inland lagoons, you had higher prothonotary warbler density in um, older, more mature sites. You also had higher occupancy and colonization with increased canopy cover. And again, canopy cover is a proxy for disturbance. So less disturbed sites are gonna have more prothonotary warblers. So again, the conservation implications of this is that you wanna preserve mature wetland, forested wetlands, wet forested wetlands. You wanna restore hydrological regimes. You wanna encourage ecotourism and reforestation, but in addition to Panama, multiple studies point to Colombia and Venezuela as being, a, especially Colombia, as being um, very important as conservation priorities. So on that note, as always in these projects, there's so many people, it takes a village. These are some of our collaborators. I wanna point out Liz Ames, Matt Bisset, and Jesse Reese, all graduate student. Liz is a graduate student at Ohio State. Matt and Jesse um, have graduated, but we're graduate students here at VCU. And also teaching assistants in the Panama Avian Ecology course. And again, Rosabel Miro and 
several other staff and um, volunteers for Panama Audubon, Columbia, Nick Daly, um, Selva Audubon, Panama Audubon with funding from Department of Defense, US Fish and Wildlife Service and Explorers Club. And with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you, Kathy. That was fantastic. And I couldn't help but think of potential collaboration with Hawk Mountain for future ecotourism trips. That would be awesome. I believe Dr. Lori Goodrich is uh, in the audience. So perhaps uh, we can chat later about that. Well, okay. I will tell you there's some very, there are, we haven't done any work with, with raptors down there, but there are mangrove hawks. And it's one of the only mangrove species that literally is tied completely to mangroves. Many of these other species will inhabit other, um, other habitats. And um, at the Cloud Forest Preserve, where we go, amazing raptors. Well, you had me at mangrove hawk and uh, Lord, <laughs> I think, yes, yes. So, um, okay, so we do have some questions coming in. Um, okay, so one question, do the birds return to winter and summer territories yearly? So they do, we have very high return rates on the breeding grounds, but that's an excellent question because one of the reasons that the working group was interested in looking across the wintering grounds at movement during the season is these are not, these birds are not territorial on the wintering grounds. A lot of, uh, well, some other neotropical migrants are, American red starts are, a lot of the research has been done on territorial uh, species that are somewhat territorial in their breeding grounds. Um, Prothonotary warblers do move around and they are not, we occasionally would recapture a bird in Panama that we had banded in Panama. Whereas in Virginia, birds return year after year. If they return and breed, they tend to come back year after year. All right, thank you. Um, uh, we have a question about your raptor studies at VCU. Um, Astrid would like to know, how do we find out more information about these raptor studies at VCU? Is there a website? There, we don't do it. So I only joined the faculty three years ago and I have here been more, uh, my PhD was on Osprey and bald eagles in the Chesapeake Bay because my master's degree actually <laughs> was in fish ecology in the James River because I was interested in fish eating birds. And so um, my PhD, I was studying the relationship, sort of predator prey relationship with bald eagles and osprey in the fish community and also doing a little population genetics. But um, right now, other than the raptor course, and I'm doing a little bit of collaboration with Hawk Mountain, I would like to do more. But at this point, um, I don't have a real active raptor program. If you're interested in raptor research in Virginia, though, I suggest you <clears throat> visit the William and Mary Center for Conservation Biology. I've collaborated with them and they do excellent work with all the raptors in Virginia. All right, thanks, Kathy. All right, another question. Uh, Department of Defense funding, what and why? <laughs> so we were working with, uh, People might not realize, but the Department of Defense owns a lot of land and they manage much of that land for wildlife. And so there is AP Hill, Fort AP Hill here in Virginia. Um, we did a project with them on prothonotary warblers. They have a large expanse of land and a lot of wetland in the Rappahannock River watershed. So it was a collaboration with uh, Fort AP Hill. Okay, thank you. So many questions are coming in. Okay, are young birds in winter found in different areas from adults? Um, we found juvenile birds, but we definitely found more adults in the older, more mature um, forests. And if you think about um, that, they're going to generally be the more experienced, they're going to probably leave the breeding grounds earlier, they're going to be more successful the first, than a first year bird arriving. They're going to um, 
probably be more likely to occupy better habitat. So. All right, thank you. All right, so you mentioned that mangrove destruction is theoretically illegal in Panama. Mm -hmm. Is that true in Colombia as well? Or based on the map, are the wintering sites in Colombia in habitats other than mangrove swamps? So um, I don't know as much about Colombia and the conservation. I know that conservation um, is very important there. I know that there was some interest in conserving mangroves there. In Panama, they have the um, IBA and, and there's some there's some protections there. They did lose protection for a little while and it was reinstated. So um, I think that's not an uncommon, even here in the US on the Chesapeake Bay, we have the Chesapeake Bay Act, which is supposed to protect a certain portion of the riparian area. And there are ways to get permits to do work. And so um, it's, not, it's not just Panama, um, it certainly happens here in the Chesapeake Bay as well. Right. All right. Thank you. What is the life expectancy of these birds? How many times roughly are the same birds caught and information collected on them? So I think that our oldest individual, and I would, I honestly would have to go back and look. I remember the nine-year-old female. Um, I think that they may have one, not here, but as old as 13 years old, that's been recorded at other sites. We are certainly not the only people who do uh, research on planetary warblers. So, um, and I would, ha it changes year to year how many individuals return. But again, I don't have the number right on, but a very large portion of individuals, if they return and they breed, they come back year after year. So we see the same females. Now we don't, we don't handle many of the males, which when I was at Hot Mountain and we were studying oven birds, a lot of studies because you use mist netting and decoys, you catch the males and don't and rarely catch the females. But because these females are nesting in boxes, it's quite easy to catch them. So we actually banned all the females we catch and band and, and monitor, we color band them so we don't have to keep recapturing them. We can see their color bands, they have unique color bands and we'll know who they are. Um, but we don't catch very many males unless we have a specific project that we're trying to um, work with males as well as females. Thank you, Kathy. We have a question from Brandon Brogel, one of our fantastic conservation science trainees uh, this season at Hawk Mountain. Does the limited access to your study plot introduce any bias into your data? So the limited access, no, because we can get there. We know how to get there around um, time of day. And, and like I said, every one of these boxes is visited twice a week. Um, there's bias in the research because we're only studying birds who nest in boxes. Mm. And there are birds nesting in natural cavities. Studying birds in natural cavities is very difficult and would require a very large field crew. Some of our collaborators and colleagues do study natural cavities and it's something we would love to do to compare and contrast um, what's going on in the boxes. The boxes are designed to discourage predation and to, to discourage um, competition with other species and to discourage nest parasitism by cowbirds. So the entrance holes are very small. Cowbirds generally can't get in there. The, they're on pole, the boxes are on poles in the water, which discourages many mammal, mammalian um, predators. So we definitely have higher nest, nest success in the boxes than birds living in natural cavities are going to have. In the boxes, are, there's a lot of competition. Uh, we do get bluebirds in the boxes. We get wrens in the boxes. Um, and we have real competition between tree swallows and prothonotary warblers. The tree swallows will actually kill prothonotary <laughs> warblers um, and build their nests on top of the warbler nests. And we're actually just 
are publishing a note. We've had two, we've had several nests where tree swallows took over a nest that had eggs in it and one or two of the prothonotary warblers hatched and fledged and was raised by the tree swallows. Oh, wow, that's so interesting. Yeah. Okay, well, that wraps up our questions. So Kathy, thank you so much. Uh, that was a fascinating program and such beautiful photos um, and the imagery. So for the video, thank you so very much. Thank you to everyone who joined us virtually in the audience. It means a lot to us that you're able to connect with us this way. Um, we hope to see you again soon. And I'd like to tell you about some upcoming programs we have at Hawk Mountain, both on site and webinars. Um, let me just see if something came in. Let me just read it. Um, oh, uh, this is a quick little question, Kathy. Uh, where are you published? Um, in different now and in several different on the journals. Um, but I can always provide you with um, a CV. <laughs> <laughs> um, and they can contact you through um, BCU. CU. You could on the staff email. Sure. So. Fantastic. Okay, so this is what we have in store at Hawk Mountain. So join us, please. Saturday, October 31st, we're having Halloween with creepy crawly creatures from 10 a.m. to noon at the Education Building. And we ask you to register advance for that on Ticket Leap. Um, Saturday, November 7th, it's Eagle Day. You don't want to miss that day. We're having live Eagle presentations presented by Carbon County Environmental Education Center at noon and 2 o'clock p.m. in our amphitheater. On Sunday, November 8th, we have Wild Women on the Mountain Skyline Hike, and that starts at 10 a.m. On Thursday, November 12th, we have a stay-at-home speaker series with Dr. Diane Husick, who's one of our board members, and it is Custodians of Our Ecosystem. Women, Raptors, and Unsettling Words at 7 o'clock p.m. And um, that, again, that's Thursday, November 12th. And then Thursday, November 19th, we have our, our final autumn lecture series webinar, and that is the American Kestrel with Dr. Allison Cornell at 7 o'clock p.m. So we hope to see you again soon, either in person or virtually. So thank you again, Kathy, and have a wonderful evening, everyone. Bye for now. Thank you.